All right, today we're going to talk about the marks of a false convert. Right now, most statistics say that about 75% of Americans are professing Christians. Okay, some say 76, some 77, some a little bit less, whatever. But it's about 75% of America that they profess to be a Christian. Now, if 75% of America is Christian we have a major problem okay so what's my point my point is 75 percent of americans are not christians okay there are false converts false professions of faith in among that statistic that's 75 percent of professing christianity it's a lot less than that but you say well how can how can you tell if a, a christian is real or fake how can you tell that? Well, I want to prove a point here. Make a point. Okay? I'm going to tell you something about myself today. I'm going to reveal a secret that no one's ever heard before. All right? This will be the first time anybody's ever heard this. You ready? I'm Superman. Did you know that? Yeah, I'm Superman. I'm seeing a lot of people laughing. <laughs> Quietly laughing. Why are you laughing? I said I'm Superman. Isn't that enough? No. no. What would it take for me to prove that I'm Superman? Start flying. Yeah. Bust the car. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Change Here's a, the, I'm going to go over some... In, you know, less than five seconds. I right. Mean. I'm going to go over some qualifications for Superman. Okay, he can fly. I can't. He can shoot red laser beams out of his eyeballs. I can't. <laughs> Uh, he can bend the thick bars of steel. I can't without the aid of a torch. <laughs> uh, and he can pick up cars. I can't. And he wears tight, you know, blue and red and yellow clothes. And I can't and I won't. <laughs> uh, but you see, I feel like I'm Superman. So I must be. Because I feel that I'm Superman. Isn't that enough? No. And it's not enough that I just say I'm Superman. I'd have to be able to prove that I'm Superman. Why should it be any different for a Christian? Amen. Why well, I feel that I'm saved. I got a good feeling about it. But can you prove that you're a Christian? Are the marks of the Holy Spirit God? I mean, think about it. The Holy Spirit of God, the creator of the universe, living within you. That should produce some changes in your life it should produce some signs some evidences that he's actually living within you and you say well the, those signs aren't there but i still feel like i am eh, that's a problem that's a big problem and you know 75 percent of americans saying that they're christians and yet the signs of the holy spirit in them are not there there's no changed life i think we're dealing with some false converts there okay and uh, you say, well, but I don't know if you can prove this, you know, that and everything. Well, if if there is such a thing as a false convert, then they would be mentioned in the Bible, yes. wouldn't they? Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Here's the one that most people are going to turn to when you deal with uh, somebody who's not truly saved. And I'm going to show you that although this can be used to make the argument, it's not really doctrinally all that great to, to prove a false convert. And we're going to see why. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Okay, it says here, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, doctrinally, this does not apply to the church age. Okay, Matthew 5-7, through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, is doctrinally aimed at believers in the millennial kingdom. And if you look there at the things that they were doing in verse 22, it's all works. Okay? And that's what salvation will be in the millennial kingdom because Jesus Christ is going to be physically present. So you, it's not a matter of faith at that point. You can see him. 
Okay, so doctrinally, eh, it's kind of a little bit shaky to try and use that for the church age. But instruction in righteousness is definitely there. The fact that people are doing works, quote-unquote good works, and yet they're still going to hell. Okay, so that does prove it, but there's stronger verses that prove that there are false converts. And we're going to look at those. Acts chapter 20. Now we're going to get into the church age, verses in the church age to prove that there are false converts. Acts chapter 20, verses 29 through 31. Okay, it says here, this is Paul writing, by the way. Uh, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, and look at this, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. Of your own selves, men will arise and speak perverse things. And by the way, watch out for any movement in Christianity that's named after a man. I'd run away from something like that. Okay? Why? Right there in verse 30. Shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them? When you have a group of people called Calvinists or Mennonites or any anything that's named after a man, you're going to be dealing with false doctrine. Okay? Because you're going to see across the board even the best Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing, saved Man of God is still going to be messed up someplace. God will not allow man to be perfect. And so to name yourself after a man and follow the teachings of that man, a lot of times they start overthrowing the Bible because if the man's off on some point, well, I have to follow him because I'm one of his followers. You know, eh, don't do that. Don't name yourself after a man, okay? Unless that man is Jesus Christ. Be a Christian. Don't be anything else. Okay, watch out for that. Now we're going to look at an even stronger example of this thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. An even stronger example of a false convert, a false professing Christian. And this is one that uh, I'm going to just tell you right up front. I'm conspiratorial. I'm not one that just thinks that everybody's honest or, or that things happen by coincidence. I do believe in conspiracy, and we're going to see a great conspiracy mentioned here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. It says here, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Did you know that one of the favorite jobs of high-level Satanists is to be preachers, to be pastors? Yeah. You talk about a false convert, a false profession of faith. You got a guy up there, he's a minister of Satan, high-level Satanist, and he's a pastor. Now, most people would look at it and say, oh, he can't be a false convert. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. You know, Eh, I don't know about that. The Bible says that Satan's ministers are ministers of righteousness. Okay? That's contrary to the way most people think. Most people think of a Satanist as some guy that wears black and, you know, is weird or something, committing human sacrifices or something. No, nope. A true minister of Satan will be in a church someplace. And I'm not just talking about Catholic or, you know, some of those, you know, weird things over there like the uh um Rowan Williams, the head of the Anglican Church right now, is also a witch. A druid witch. And he admits it. You know, it's not like a some hidden secret thing that you have to find out through going into secret files or something. He admits it. Okay? I'm not just talking about them. I'm talking about Men in supposedly Bible-believing churches oftentimes will be ministers of Satan. But uh, watch out, by the way, there it says in verse 13, 
such are false apostles. And then it says transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And I don't have time to get into the whole study there, but an apostle is a man that has seen Jesus Christ. Okay? Don't fall for anybody saying today that they're an apostle. There aren't any apostles today. All right? Watch out for that. And uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, by the way, says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, but and hast... And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. So look out for that thing of somebody saying that they're an apostle. There aren't any today. But now look at uh, verse 26 there in Second Corinthians chapter 11. Here you have Paul going over his qualifications. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. Now look at this one. In perils among false brethren. Oh, all you got to do is believe and receive. You just say you're saved. You say you're a Christian. You feel like you're a Christian. And that's all there is to it. Uh-uh. Paul identifies that there are false brethren. Okay? It's right there. You can't escape that. Okay, now we're going to go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to see this thing again. 2 Peter chapter... I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Okay, it says here, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Let me stop there for just a minute. You say, well, you know, a lot of these people, a lot of these modern churches, you know, they don't deny Jesus. You know, they don't, they don't deny Jesus. They talk about Jesus. So they're not false prophets. Uh, but look at the Jesus who they profess. He has no basis in Scripture. The Jesus of most modern churches is actually the Antichrist. Okay? The Antichrist comes and he brings all religions together. And he doesn't have the desire of women. He doesn't regard the God of his fathers. He causes times and seasons and things to change. And you look at the modern Jesus that's preached in these churches, that's exactly what he's for. He's, he's against absolute truth and being dogmatic on things and he wants people to unite and he's okay with everything out there he's okay with sin he's okay with rock music he loves rock music he's a homeboy he's all this stuff yeah it's the antichrist so you say well they're you know they're denying the lord that they aren't denying the lord because they say jesus no they're denying the true jesus of, of scripture so watch out for that somebody can talk about jesus and not be referring to the Jesus of the Bible. We're going to see that in just a little bit. Uh, verse 2. And look at this. This is talking here about the last days, by the way. It says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. You know, that's another thing, another sign of a false prophet. They will attack King James Bible believers that defend the old hymns, that defend the old faith. They'll attack them. It isn't just, you know, well, we appreciate, you know, that stuff, and that's great if you believe. Uh-uh. They'll attack you. They'll come out after you. Verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Interesting. <clears throat> One other sign of a false prophet, of a false convert, They'll be extremely rich. They're in the church ministry for the money. We just watched a thing here uh, just uh, this past week about Kenneth Copeland, big uh, televangelist on TV. He lives in an 18,000 square foot home on the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? Six million dollar house. It has a boathouse for his yachts. He has his own private airport including multiple airplanes. Why do you need more than one airplane? Okay? And his pride and joy, his his biggest airplane, it's a private jet 
that cost twenty million dollars. And this guy's a minister. And there's a lot more I could say on Kenneth Copeland. You know, do a little bit of research into that guy. He's not a Christian. He's a very, very, very evil man. And I mean, he'll he'll be up front and he'll start you know growling when he talks and stuff, and he'll he'll be speaking in tongues, quote unquote, and tell people to take the mark of the beast. You know, I have that thing on video. I mean, he's he's uh, just filled with devils. I mean, he's an evil man. I mean, just looking at him, it's like whoa, you know, it creeps you out. You know. I mean, it gives you chills when you hear the guy speaking. But people think he's a Christian. And people follow him and people give him money. I mean, you know, you get this guy flying by in a $20 million jet and it's a, yay, there's our pastor. You know, don't you have any sense? What kind of pastor needs a $20 million jet and lives in a giant mansion? What's going on? Through covetousness, shall they with Feigned words. Feigned words means faked. They're not real. Oh, we're so happy to have you here today. That's feigned. He's not really happy to have the people there. He's happy to have their money there. Okay? And you say, well, that isn't fair. He's getting away with it. Oh, no, he isn't. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Okay, don't worry about it. God's going to take care of them. Jump down to verse 20 there. In Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter two, verse twenty. Now you need to see a key word here. I'm going to talk about it as we continue. It says, "For if you have another Bible, if there's a condition there, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ." They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Okay, let me just stop there. What's the key word? Two key words. If and knowledge. Okay, it doesn't say that they were saved. It says that they had the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay, this morning I had the knowledge of Superman. But that didn't make me Superman. Okay, I can profess to be Superman all day long. I can walk around saying, I'm Superman, I'm Superman, I'm Superman. It doesn't prove anything. Okay, and people can walk around saying that they're a Christian. That doesn't prove anything. You can have a knowledge. If I studied Islam, I could pretend to be a Muslim. Would that make me a Muslim? No. You know, wouldn't make me a Muslim. I could pretend that I'm a Catholic. I could pretend that I'm a Buddhist. I could pretend that... It, I could pretend all kinds of things. Okay, you can study, an actor can study Christianity and learn how to talk like a Christian, learn how to act like a Christian, and still be lost. And there are a lot of people that go off to some church somewhere and they get a head knowledge of what to say and what how to answer questions, and they feel that they're saved. But there's never been a conversion there. You know, there's a thing it says about that you miss heaven by 18 inches, you know. I heard that the first time and I thought, what's that all about? It's up here in your head, but it never makes it down to your heart, okay? You know the right things to say, but you never really have that heartfelt conviction of, man, I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I deserve to go to hell, you know. I've sinned before God, and my only chance is Jesus Christ. You never get to that point. A lot of people don't get there. They can't give up their self-righteousness. They can't imagine that God would send them to an eternity in hell. So I'm not that bad. I, I, I can't imagine that. But you have to get by that. If you want to be saved, you have to get to a point where you say, yeah, I deserve to go to hell. You know, I should be going there for the things that I've done. And the only chance I have at getting out of this thing is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's it. There is no other chance for me. But people don't like that. Because you have to come to the end of yourself, you see. And so most people, they want to be part of their little church thing and they want to go to heaven when they die. And so they, well, I'm a good person and I feel that I'm saved. I feel like I'm a Christian. But you pin them right down and you start to talk to them about sin and you start to talk to them about God's wrath and judgment and, and everything. And it doesn't work out. It's like, no, nah, something doesn't happen there. 
Well, let's continue here. Verse 21. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. That's what the Lord thinks of a false convert. He looks down at the woman and he looks down at the man and he says, That guy's a dog. Looks at the woman and he says, That's a sow, female pig. <laughs> That's what the Lord thinks. Oh, God's not sarcastic. God respects the sinner. No, he doesn't. And notice there in verse 21, it says, It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. You'd be better off dealing with lost sinners out in the world, some drunk that walks out of the bar and stumbling around and, and things. He's better to deal with than somebody that goes to a church somewhere. One of that 75% of professing Christianity here in America. They're tough to deal with. Because they have a higher level of self-righteousness than the guy who knows he's a sinner. You know, that's why a lot of people, a lot of the brethren, I mean, it'd be great to get into, but there's just only so many ministries you can be involved with. But a lot of the brethren, they go to prisons, prison ministry. And they usually do pretty good. Because... Who's going to be in prison and say that they're not a sinner? I mean, it's pretty easy to convince a, a guy or a, a woman even now today that they're a sinner when they're in jail. They're behind bars and you say, are you a sinner? You know, no, I'm, I'm not a bad person. <laughs> they're not going to say that. They're going to say, yes, I'm a sinner. You know, but you go out to the average person that walks out of a church building on a Sunday morning that does good things. Are you a sinner? <gasps> Who are you talking to? You know, I'm a good person. Well, it had been better if they hadn't known that. If they hadn't been told that they were a good person. It would have been a lot easier. Okay. Uh, another point I wanted to make real quick here. Um, I guess we'll go on for sake of time. I don't want to... That's another thing there. Go off in another direction. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, uh, verse 18. We're going to see another false convert here. And this is very relevant to today, by the way. Okay, it says here in verse 18, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. Remember what I said earlier, that these modern churches are preaching the Antichrist? That's the Jesus that they believe in? Yeah. Um, verse 19. Now look at this. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Sounds like a false convert to me. For if, there's another Bible if, for if, if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You know, one of the most amazing things to me, people that were raised in conservative churches 20, 30 years ago, and how they quit, and now they're actually anti-conservative church. What do we just read there? they would no doubt have continued with us. It's a major problem when you have people that profess to be saved and sin and compromise comes along and they go, ooh, and they jump over to there. If the Holy Spirit's in them, wouldn't he kind of convict them of some of that? I would think so. Well, what about carnal Christians? What about carnality? You know what this whole modern movement is? This whole modern thing of easy believism, just pray the prayer and you're in? You know what it is? They constantly are trying to justify sin. You should take it more easy on sin. You shouldn't be so strict. You're trying to teach works-based salvation, all this stuff. No, I'm not. God's standards are so much higher than we can meet. I mean, why did the Lord say, Be ye holy as I am holy? Oh, well, that's really not, you know, that important. I mean, we shouldn't be that separated from sin and... That's what the modern church is teaching. And, you know, oh, let's not talk about repentance. That's, that's you know, kind of lordship salvation. And 
thing. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's what the Bible teaches. It's what the Bible commands. And if you were truly saved and truly of, and the Holy Spirit was in you, there'd be some conviction of sin there. But you see these people that 20 years ago they were conservative and now they're just radical liberal. I'm sorry, I don't think it took. I don't think that they got saved. Why? Well, if they were of us, they would have continued with us. They wouldn't have fallen away. Well, what if you're wrong? Well, if I'm wrong, I mean, think about that. If I'm wrong, I'll get up there and the Lord's going to say to me at the judgment seat of Christ, you know, Brian, you shouldn't have been so tough on sin. You think the Lord's going to say that? Stand there before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ and he'll say, you know, you really shouldn't have told people to stay away from worldliness and to, and to quit, you know, sinning and things like that. You, you really should have taken a lighter attitude on sin. I mean, you believe the Lord's going to say that? It's absurd. It's absolutely ridiculous. But that's what a lot of people think. It's what a lot of people believe. First uh, John chapter 4. Go over there. Cross the page for some. Maybe turn a page for others. First John chapter 4 verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. I put emphasis on the word is come in the flesh because that's what you say about somebody who is still alive. Okay? And it's interesting because if you have an NIV, it says has come in the flesh. And it also says in another portion of Scripture, it says that his origins are from ancient times. King James Bible says everlasting. Okay, the Christ of the NIV is a different Christ than the one found in the pages of the King James Bible. He's an antichrist. And I've proved that in many, many studies. Okay, but it says there that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That that uh, spirit is of God. Look at verse 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of antichrist Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Don't think that the spirit of Antichrist is going to show up after we leave. Okay? And right now everything's just going to be wonderful and Christian, and then when the rapture hits, boom, we leave, and then the Antichrist shows up. Okay? The Antichrist in person will show up at that point, yes. But the spirit is already being prepared right now. And where is it being prepared? In the churches. Yep, among the professing Christians. Just like I said earlier, the Spirit is being prepared. The Jesus Christ of the Bible that people were getting mad at and throwing rocks at and everything else, and then they eventually killed him, people do the same thing today. If Jesus Christ in the Bible, you know, the, the biblical Jesus Christ, if he showed up and ministered to the average modern church, they would hate him just as bad as the Jews did back in when he was here on the earth the first time. They would. They wouldn't accept him. You know, they want to accept the Antichrist. It's incredible. Uh, verse 4. It says here, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. There's another test for a false convert. What is it? They are of the world. Do you know Christians that are worldly? I do. Therefore, speak they of the world. You know, I saw something that was kind of shocking yesterday. I was at a gas station here locally. I live in Lancaster County. That's where we are located at. I saw four girls. I don't know if they were Mennonite or Brethren. And they were renting a movie. They have these DVD Hollywood movie vending machines. The red box or whatever. Yeah. And they're renting one. And I just thought to myself, you're standing there with a head covering on and a dress and stuff, and you're renting a Hollywood movie? What is this? Oh, they're just carnal. They're just, you know, they're just kind of, you know, a little bit out of fellowship. Really? Would it be safer to err on the side of caution and just say, you know what, I don't think they're really saved? 
I mean, shouldn't there be some conviction there? They speak of the world. And look at the, the last part there. And the world heareth them. Do you have good fellowship with the lost world? Something's wrong if you do. If the lost world likes to be around you and they say, oh, yeah, he's a good guy. Or, you know, he's a lot of fun to be around. He tells some good jokes. That's a problem. You're not supposed to be that way. The world is supposed to see a difference in you. If God's Holy Spirit is living within you, the lost world should see it. You know, there's an old saying, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? There better be. Something to think about. Verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Who is the manifestation of truth? Jesus Christ. Who is the father of lies? Satan. So you have a choice to follow one or the other. Somebody that loves the truth and wants to hear the truth and wants to speak the truth, well, there's probably a good ch chance that if they're a professing Christian, there's a good chance that they're saved. In fact, they probably are saved if they just love the truth and are obsessed with it. But you have somebody who's a professing Christian and they hate the truth. They don't want anything to do with the truth. They don't want to study the truth. They don't want to hear it. Don't even talk to me about it. And the things that they talk about are worldly and lies. I think you're dealing with a false convert. So that's kind of tough. That's kind of a tough standard. Yeah, it is a tough standard. Okay? But I believe from Scripture that it's God's standard. I mean, what do you, do you think that I have higher standards than the Lord? Do you think that when you stand before God someday that He's going to say, Oh, yeah, don't worry about the sins and the, don't worry about that worldliness. And Yeah, you followed the devil for a while, but, you know, no big deal. I think God's standards are a lot higher than ours. You know, I mean, why are we trying to bring down the standards? Things that Christians would never have stood for even 40, 30, 20 years ago now are accepted. Oh, but that's okay. You know, let's bring, let's bring the standards down. No. Okay, now I want to ask a question. Are these the words of a Christian? The words I'm going to read to you. Somebody said here that Jesus is, quote, the Holy One of God. Does that sound like something a Christian would say? Don't answer. I know you know the answer to it. That's why I said that. Does that sound like something a Christian would say? Jesus is the Holy One of God? How about Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? Turn to Luke chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 4, verse 33. Somebody walked into an average church today and they said, I believe Jesus is the Holy One of God. You can, I guarantee you people will be going, Amen, yeah, praise the Lord, woo, yeah, you know. But let's look here. It says here in Luke chapter 4, verse 33, and in the synagogue there was a, a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, up oh, the Holy One of God. It's a devil. A devil is saying that Jesus is the Holy One of God. Hmm. Look at verse 41. And devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was Christ. Isn't that something? Devils that believe that Jesus is Christ. So when you have a false prophet like Rick Warren that says salvation is believe and receive, well, according to that plan of salvation, the devils could get saved too. You say, oh, well, I, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. James chapter 2. Turn to James chapter 2, verse 19. 
He says, salvation is just belief. Only believe. Only believe. All things are possible if you only believe. Right? James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Did you know that the devils fear God? They do. Why do you think they were all upset about Jesus Christ being there? Art thou come hither to destroy us? They feared. They feared God. The devils were actually more reverent than a lot of the people that met Jesus. They knew who he was. They confessed who he was publicly. And they feared him. Well, according to a lot of people today, that those are qualifications for salvation. No, it's not. There are no saved devils. <laughs> okay? That's bad. Very, very bad. Titus chapter 1. Turn there to Titus chapter 1. A couple chapters before James there. Titus 1 verse 15. Okay, it says here, Titus 1, 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They, notice the they there, who's the they talking about? The unbelieving. Okay, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Well, isn't that interesting? Paul says that these people here are unbelieving, but they profess that they know God. They profess that they're saved. Well, how do you tell that they're not? By their works. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. It's right there. Salvation isn't just something that anybody can just... You just pray a prayer, magically, now you're in. No, there has to be some changes there. And that's not works-based salvation. You don't do good works to get saved. No, no, we don't teach that. But there should be evidence of salvation after you get saved. There needs to be good works after you get saved. And if there aren't, something didn't take. If you profess to be Superman and you can't manifest the signs of Superman, then you're not Superman. And the same thing applies to being a Christian. If there's no change in your life after you get saved, God's Holy Spirit didn't come in. Okay? It's just incredible. Okay, a couple things I wanted to, to say here about these passages real quick. Uh, first of all, they are unbelieving, but they profess salvation. I already talked about that. Uh, number two, they prove their lost state by the lives that they live. Yeah. But now number three, the thing I wanted to say here, they do good works, but they are reprobate. In other words, their good works are not based on Scripture. you got to watch out for that. There's a lot of people that say, oh, I do good works and good things. Okay, let's look at some of these good works. You know, they say, what would Jesus do? When did Jesus ever mow a lawn for somebody? You see that with these modern churches. They go around and mow people's lawns, and this is a good work. When did Jesus ever sell baked goods? Or the disciples? Or the Christians, the early Christians? When were they ever doing that? They didn't. And now they didn't have car washes back then, but we'll say a chariot wash. When did they ever put one of them on? Could you show me one in Scripture? How about organize a free clothing bank? You say, well, you're saying that those aren't good works? No, those are nice things to do. You know, if you want to be involved in something like that, uh, okay. But not at the expense of forsaking preaching the gospel and getting people mad. Yeah. You better be doing those things. You see, the lost world does those same things. They do nice things for people. I mean, the Rockefellers give to all kinds of charity. Does that prove that the Rockefellers are saved because they're nice? No. How about the Catholics? The Catholics do a lot of good works. So do the Masons. So do a lot of those cults. Well, that proves that they're saved because they have good works. No. Their works are reprobate. Okay? They do nice things for people, but they are not nice enough themselves to realize that they're a sinner and that they need Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
and they're not nice enough to warn people about hell. Okay, anybody that doesn't preach on hell, there's a problem there. Okay, um, just as another way to illustrate this point. If I gave people, let's say a family comes in and I give them a good meal and a brand new car and $10,000 in cash and then say, go on down that road there, that'll take you right, you know, it's a shortcut to take you home. And in the back of my mind, I know that the bridge is out up there and it's a blind corner and it's at night and you can't see it. Was I nice? No. Oh, but come on, I gave him a meal. I gave him a new car and I gave him $10,000 in cash. But what good's that going to do them when they're dead laying at the bottom of the gorge? See? If you do nice things for people as a Christian, you mow their yard and you wash their car and you take their groceries into the house for them, but you don't warn them about hell, you don't love them. Okay? True love as a Christian is to preach the gospel to people. That's true love. And when you tell somebody that you can get saved and you can have a wonderful life and you can go to heaven and everything else, but you don't warn them about God's judgment, you don't warn them about the fact that they're sinners and they need to repent, you're not loving them. You're not showing them love. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Another question comes up here. Should you question your salvation? Some people say, oh no, you know, the devil gets me to doubt my salvation. Well, that can happen, but uh, you're going to see here that uh, sometimes it might be the Holy Spirit actually saying, hey, maybe you need to think about whether you're really saved or not. Second Corinthians chapter uh, 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? You should know. Remember what we read there earlier here in Titus about unto every good work, reprobate? Watch out for the thing about being reprobate. You shouldn't be that as a Christian. Okay? But you need to examine yourself. And you need to say, am I really saved? There's nothing wrong with doing that. Now, if you're doing it all the time and doubting your salvation, well, you're not going to get much done for the Lord. You need to get to the point where you say, yes, I'm saved. You know, I've asked the Lord to forgive my sins. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. You know, I still have some problems with the flesh I'm trying to take care of. But I believe the King James Bible. I believe in soul winning. I believe in eternal security. Go down through the list. I believe those things. Am I saved? Yeah. There's nothing else I can do, you know, to be saved. Okay, that's fine. You need to be secure in your salvation. But for these people out there, these modern Christians, they would do very well to ask themselves that question. And by the way, who's this written to? The Corinthians. The most carnal people out there. And these easy believism people, they'll take you to the books of First and Second Corinthians to prove that Christians can live in sin and sin and sin and sin and still be saved. It's a weird movement. Very, very weird movement. Okay, but... You should examine yourself. All right? Now, finally here, what is true salvation? Acts chapter 20. Turn back to the book of Acts. We were there earlier. Read a couple of verses about warning about false prophets. Verses 29 through 31. But we're going to be up there in verse 21 now. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Okay, it says here, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now there are two things mentioned there. Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Two things. You say, well, then you're teaching works-based salvation. No, because those two things happen at the same time. You realize, hey, I'm a sinner. I can't make it to heaven. All right, I, It's just not going to happen. I can't make it there with my own good works. What am I going to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Realize you're a sinner. Repent toward God. Repentance means that you're turning. 
You turn away from your self-righteousness and you turn to God as the only means of salvation. And then you put your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you don't take that first step, if you just come and say, I profess that I believe in Jesus Christ, you're not doing anything that the devils don't do. There are devils. Demons is another way to say it. That's a Greek word there. Devils that believe in Jesus Christ. But they're not about to repent. Okay? Don't fall for the thing of there's no repentance involved with salvation. That's a lie. That's a total lie. And it's going to damn a lot of people to hell because all they're going to have is a knowledge. The same knowledge that the, that, that the devils have. Okay? Uh, Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, verse 17... Uh, when Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. See it there again. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Are you a sinner? Better be answering yes to that. Um, and I, you know, another thing here, the, the easy believism people, they say that repentance comes after salvation because the lost can't know that they are sinners without the Holy Ghost. Okay, that's another one of the lies that you're going to be told, that the lost can't know that they're sinners. But we're going to see about that here. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Luke seven thirty six it says here, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were, were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. What did Jesus say? He came to call. Who did he say? Sinners to repentance. Sinners to repentance. She's in a perfect position. But she came to him as a sinner. She had conviction of sin and came to him. Jesus didn't even have to preach to her. See, she came and she's repenting. It's right there. Don't fall for this lie that all oh, sinners, they can't know that they're sinners until after they're saved. That's nonsense. That is an absolute lie. Okay, and it's not lordship salvation to tell people that they're sinners and to get them to admit that they're sinners before they get saved. That's not lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is that you do good works and get your life cleaned up and then you get saved. Okay, don't confuse the two. A lot of people are very ignorant out there and they're going out and shooting their mouths off that you know repentance before salvation is lordship salvation. That isn't it. People need to study a little bit more before they go out and try to make videos or recordings or whatever. It's just really bad, the ignorance out there. Uh, now we're looking here at verse 40. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, 
but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he saith unto the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. Now this is pre-crucifixion, but Jesus Christ is giving an, a model here for future salvation after the cross. Okay? She came as a sinner and repented. And Jesus said, Thy faith has saved thee. See, it's one event. She didn't come to him twice. She came as a sinner, believing that he could forgive her sins and heal her. Okay? And there's other stories there too, you know, where a woman came that was in adultery, you know, Tim at the well and, and everything, and he says, you know, Thy faith has saved thee. Go and sin no more. You know, it wasn't the woman at the well. It was a woman that came. They were going to stone her. You know, the woman taken in adultery. But the point is, you come to Jesus as a sinner. Okay? And then you accept him as your Savior. That's salvation. And most of the people that are out there that profess to be saved, they haven't taken those steps. It's really, really bad. And you say, well, I'm, I'm still not convinced. I still think that, uh, you know, you just get saved by praying a prayer. And you don't have to have your sins preached against. And you don't have to come to a place where you're broken. You know, you just pray the prayer. Just believe. Only believe, you know. Some people say that. Okay, well, let me ask you two questions. If somebody came to Jesus, to God, we'll say, they come to God and they say, I believe in Jesus, but... I refuse to give up my life as a sinner. I'm a gambler. I'm a drunk. I'm a fornicator, whatever. And I'm going to keep doing that. But I'm going to pray this prayer and you are forced to save me. Will God save him? No. Oh, but they said that they were saved. Yeah, they said they were Superman too, right? No, it doesn't work. How about an atheist that mockingly Praise a prayer. I've had that happen. You know, I get into little heated debates with people online, and they, you know, these atheists, they'll they'll make fun and they'll say, "Oh God, I'm a sinner and I accept Jesus as my Savior." You know, ha 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 ha. Are they saved? No. But they prayed a prayer. It wasn't genuine. Right. They didn't repent. There was no repentance there. See. God is not forced to save people simply because they believe and say a, a little prayer. God looks at the heart and he sees, is this person coming to me in a repentant state? And if they're not, they don't get in. Just as simple as that. Uh, Luke chapter 18. A couple more places to turn to here today before we finish. Luke chapter 18 verse 7. And, you know, I've preached on this subject before and people say, oh, I've, you know, I've heard this thing about repentance before. Why do you keep preaching on it? Well, because people are, are teaching this stuff more and more and more. All you do is just believe. Just believe and receive. That's it. It's just bad. Luke chapter 18, verse 7. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Here in the passage, it's talking about the Jews. Has God had to bear along with them? <laughs> you better believe it. <clears throat> yeah. Verse 8. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And I just wanted to throw that thing in there. Uh, the fact is, when Jesus Christ comes back, he doesn't say, man, everybody's safe. 75% of Americans are Christians. He doesn't say that. He says, shall he find faith on the earth? Hmm. When he comes back, there aren't going to be that many people that are saved. And now, I believe in context there, that's the second coming. You know, but the point is, we're not heading into spiritual revival. Okay, it's apostasy. It's the exact opposite direction. Every dispensation ends in apostasy. It's just the way it is. 
look at verse 9 there. <clears throat> and we're going to hear a story here. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Hmm. Didn't we read about that earlier? About false prophets? They trust in their own self-righteousness and they despise you know, by whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. It's right there. He's talking to self-righteous people. And here's the parable. Verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Well, he must be saved. He's got to be saved. He's a good guy and very religious. Look at verse 13. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, that publican was dealing with people a lot and was taking money from people. Basically, they were a tax collector. I bet you felt like a low-down, dirty snake a lot of times when you were working as that in that job. Poor family coming up and saying, please, is there any way that we can... Get out of paying this, this tax. No, I'm sorry. I have to take it. But we aren't going to be able to eat if you take our money. Sorry. Too bad. i got to take it. You know, you could be convinced pretty quickly that you're a sinner when you do that for a living. <laughs> Probably feel pretty rotten a lot of times. And that guy, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. But smote upon his breast, just took his hand and just hit himself like that and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He knew he was going to hell. You know, and he cried out to God. Repentance toward God is what you see there. Verse 14, I tell you, this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other, the Pharisee. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Did you know it's a humbling experience to confess that you're a sinner? To look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? You're no good. You know? To look down at your arms and your hands and say, that's disgusting. These are the hands of a sinner. Those are the feet of a sinner, the legs of a sinner, the body of a sinner, the brains of a sinner. I can't work my way into heaven. There's no way I'm getting in. I deserve to go to hell. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's humbling. You have to humble yourself to do that. But what happens in the lost world is they exalt themselves. Look at the Pope. The processional that, that follows him walking, you know, with his robe and his shepherd's staff, you know, or crooked cross, whatever he's carrying. And, you know, I'm not making that up. That's what he does. And walking along and everybody, you know, following him and burning incense and all this stuff. What is that? He's exalting himself, you know sitting in his throne with the upside-down cross on it, and, you know, putting out his hand with the ring, and the people come up and bow to him and kiss his ring. What is that? It's a self-righteous sinner that has no need for Jesus Christ. When's the last time you heard the Pope preach repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ? Give me a break. They don't preach it. He's a political ruler, is all he is. Okay, let's see where we're going to turn to here next. And by the way, you say, well, I don't know about this stuff. You know, I, I think that most, you know, Christians out there, you know, they're they're saved and everything. Okay, go up to them and ask them if they're a sinner. Go to the average Christian, professing Christian, and say, are you a wicked sinner? You know, look at the reaction you get. Most of them will. Why would you even ask a question like that? That's a horrible thing. Every once in a while you'll run into a truly saved believer and they'll say, they'll kind of drop their head and, yeah. You know, and boy, it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that's going to save me. Man, you know, I don't deserve to go to heaven and I'm so thankful to Jesus that he saved me. That's the right answer. Not, oh, I'm not a bad person. I do a lot of good things. Yeah, and you're a false convert, more than likely. 
Now, you say, well then, a true Christian never sins. Right? Wrong. Romans chapter 7. We're going to see about this thing here. Romans chapter 7, verse 23. Okay, here you have Paul, greatest Christian that ever, that ever lived. I don't think anybody would argue that point. Uh, it says here in verse 23, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Uh, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Uh, verse 18 there, if you jump up to there, it says, For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. If you see a person who's a professing Christian and they are struggling with the flesh, chances are that they are saved. Okay, I've seen a lot of Christians... I don't have my flesh totally 100% under control. There are still things I struggle with, still sins of the flesh that I struggle with. And I won't be quick to judge somebody that says that they're a Christian. I'm a Christian, you know, and, and they just they have some kind of a fleshly sin problem. I'm not real quick to jump on somebody like that. You know, I'll try to encourage them, try to say, you know, hey, man, you really need to give that up or, you, you know, whatever. I'll take it easy on somebody like that. Because you're going to have struggles with your flesh. There's a war between the spirit and the flesh at all times. Till the day you die. Yeah, till the day you die. And the only thing that can deliver you uh, from that is Jesus Christ there, by the way, too. We read in the passage. But I will judge a professing Christian when there's spiritual problems. When there's a different spirit. Remember what it said there in 1 John? Beloved, believe not every spirit but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Okay? That's something that you need to be very careful about. Don't believe every spirit. If somebody has problems with the flesh, that's one thing. You know, you might have a carnal Christian there, whatever. But when there's spirit problems, and they're saying things that are doctrines of devils, that are clearly not based on Scripture, oftentimes you're dealing with a lost false convert okay john chapter 16 verse 13 says how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come john seventeen seventeen says sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth what is somebody's reaction to this king james bible right here I mean, take it easy. There are some people out there that are using the new versions ignorantly. But I've seen it. I was one that I was using a new version and somebody presented the King James issue to me and I converted. It didn't take me very long at all. Why? Because the spirit of truth was in me. I was saved. And he guided me into all truth. I had a conviction. I mean, you know, the King James Bible says... God was manifest in the flesh. The NIV says, He who appeared in a body. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the King James Bible is the right reading. And then multiply that times the other hundreds and thousands of verse perversions in these new Bibles. It's right there. You know, you get the Catholic Church that uh, killed tens of millions of Christians down through the centuries, and they believe salvation comes from the <laughs> Eucharist, eating and drinking uh, the flesh and blood of Jesus and stuff. Weird. As a Christian, you should instantly say, ugh, something's wrong there. But you get these professing Christians, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Catholic Church. I have some of my best friends are Catholics and, and I go to the Catholic Church occasionally and, and I really enjoy it. It's really holy and things. You're not saved. If you can go sit in a Catholic church and have no problem at all and just you know get, be part of the celebration there and everything and just feel totally at home. The NIV translators did part of their translation work at a Catholic university. And they said an order, an, an order of Catholic nuns operates the residence and affectionate ties of Christian love soon bind the hearts and minds of all together in a, in a marvelous way, I think is how it went. A little leaven. leaven I mean, 
you can't tell me that those people were saved and feel totally at home with Catholic nuns? Shouldn't your soul be screaming out within you saying, you people are falling for it, you know, you women, you're falling for the false system of Catholicism. That's the way a Christian should feel. See? And you, you read the writings of a lot of these New Version translators, they hate the King James Bible. It isn't just a thing of, well, you know, we kind of like to offer a different... No, they hate it. They want to get rid of it. It's a different spirit. See? Okay? If God's spirit of truth is in a believer, you will see maybe some problems with the flesh, but that spirit of truth will lead them into the truth. And their attitude towards truth, maybe at first there will be some hesitation, but eventually they're going to accept it. Okay? It's right there. And if they don't accept the truth and they hate the truth, you're dealing with a false convert. Just the way it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the last place we're going to go to. And I'm planning a message on this eventually. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of things going, and I don't I don't think I'm ever going to not have a lot of things going. <laughs> you know, I got I write down lists of sermons to preach and videos to make, and it's like I get a bunch of the things done on the list, and the Lord says, "Okay, that's a real good job there." Okay, here's 50 more. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh man. You know, I get emails from people. Could you do a sermon on this? And that, you know, that's great. That's that's wonderful. You know, but it's, man, probably never going to get around to everything that I have to do. But this is one that I do have planned for the hopefully not too distant future. The question comes up, when will the proof be of who is truly saved and who isn't? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, not false brethren, but brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. There's another one of the signs of a false convert. Are they movable? Or are they standing fast? As a Christian, you should be standing fast and contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. You shouldn't be moving your position. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Okay? Oh, they profess that they know God. Yeah, but in works they, they deny Him. You're to always abound in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now the message that I have planned eventually is going to be called the pre-tribulation rapture judgment. Because it's going to be a judgment. You say, what's the judgment? Well, the Lord's going to sort out that 75% of professing Christianity. And we're going to see who was really truly saved and who wasn't. Okay? It's going to happen quick, too. And it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. You know, as it says there in verse 52. There's not going to be any time. When the rapture hits, there, you're not going to have time to say, oh, wait a second, I didn't repent. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was just kind of self-righteous and, you know, I think I'm going to get saved now. Nope. You miss it, you're going to be here for God's outpouring of wrath for seven years. You might not go to hell, you might still have a chance to get saved, but it's going to be real difficult. Okay? Salvation in that time period that's coming is going to require that you lose your life. You're going to be an enemy of the new world order. They're going to hunt you down like an animal. And more than likely, they'll catch you. 
Okay, and unfortunately, a lot of the professing Christians that are out there right now, they're already databased. They're already part of government churches, 501c3 churches. They already have records on you. And these false converts, when the real rapture hits and they get left, left behind, and they realize, you know what, I don't think I was really saved. That system of the Antichrist is going to come in and the Bible says, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Your chance of getting saved after the rapture, if you're a professing Christian right now, but not a possessing Christian, your chance of getting saved is going to be very, very, very small. Very small. It's going to be super, super bad. And I'm telling you, examine yourself. Whether you be in the faith, you better do it. There are many, many, many false converts out there many of them that are teaching damnable doctrines doctrines of devils horrible terrible things i can tell you right now that the average modern church is so filled full of devils that you wouldn't catch me dead in one of them places we just heard a thing last night i was listening to a, a message by dr scott johnson and he was talking about how christianity's just falling apart and they had a, a Southern Baptist pastor at a NASCAR event. And he gave a NASCAR prayer. And it was all, you know, charismatic, you know. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Chevys and the Fords and the Dodges that are gathered here today. And the powerful V8 engines and the, and the Goodyear tires to keep the cars on the track and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Dr. Scott Johnson was like, what that does is... It tells lost world, hey, this guy's kind of cool. Well, you know what? Maybe I'm kind of cool. Maybe me and my sin, maybe God loves me. You know, that preacher there, he's a pastor. You know, he's a pastor of a big church. He didn't say anything about sin. Maybe God doesn't feel so bad about sin after all. Maybe I can continue in my sins and just say I believe in the big guy upstairs. You know, and I can be saved. See, what that pastor was, he was a false convert. Probably a minister of Satan. No man with the Holy Spirit in him would have prayed a prayer like that. And then at the end he said, in Jesus' name, and then, I forget even what he said, hooga booga booga or blibbity blobbity blibbity, amen, or something like that. Total blasphemy. Just disgusting. And he talked about his smoking hot wife in the prayer too. And, it, and you know, take that and multiply it times 10,000 every Sunday. The blasphemy and the filth that's going on in the average professing church has no basis in Scripture. They're false converts. There are many, many false converts. In fact, I would say the vast majority of professing Christians are false. They're not truly saved. So that's going to be it for this morning. Watch out for the easy believism gospel. Watch out. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.